Hello everybody and welcome to another hobby cheating video. Recently Games Workshop sent me this guy and that was very nice of them. I appreciate it. I don't actually play 40k orcs but I do play fantasy orcs so I like Age of Sigmar orcs. Those are fun and I like painting orcs and as I was thinking about what to do with this guy I looked on the cover and I saw Great White, Great White Shark, Tiger Shark, Tiger Squig. So today we're going to do two things. First, we're going to learn how to paint a tiger pattern, which is fun, and that's a cool thing, and it's cool to make a giant squig look like a giant tiger. But more importantly, we're going to talk about why sometimes it's just okay to have fun in your miniature painting. So let's go have some fun. Uh, the strict technomancer that is Vinci V. Let us get to the technique and learn it Vinci V style. So for our fun project today, we're going to paint this big orc boss on Squig. And I love Squigs. Squigs are always in themselves fun. And this is one of the first keys when you're picking a project that's just for fun. Pick some subject that you think is fun and entertaining, that's different, that's unusual, that has character to it, that inspires you, that has life, that has energy, that gets your juices flowing in some creative way. Now, throughout this whole process, uh, I'm not going to talk as much about like the paints I'm using. Those will be scrolling up top. Uh, you'll notice I did start over black. That's because I'm actually doing the zenithal with colors, and I'm going to show you how I do that here. Uh, my goal, though, was to set the initial tones for my tiger. Now, I'm going to pop a tiger up on screen here. Now, what you can see from the tiger is that tigers have a sort of orange-ish top and a white-ish belly. But when I, the more I looked at it, the more I noticed that there was a lot more going on. There's lots of yellow tones, the fur sort of crisscrosses, the orange on the top is a lot lighter than the orange on the bottom. Let's look at that one more time. Okay, so that's why I'm laying down this paint in the way I am. I'm setting down this to sort of create the color differentiation that's going to eventually happen. I'm trying to really lighten up the belly because that's the kind of white soft underbelly and I'm also needing to adapt what is normally a creature with fur to a creature with smooth rubbery beach ball skin, namely this big angry squig. Uh, I'm also taking the opportunity here to go ahead and, you know, Zenithal the orc himself on top with my final white highlight color just to get myself going there for what will eventually be me finishing the orc. I won't talk about the orc in this video. But I have many other videos where I've talked about painting orc skin and things like that. You can find that linked up below or linked up above. But the important part here, as always, since orange is going to be one of our colors, is I've got to set a good undershade. And working a lot in the airbrush to me is fun. Perhaps for you it's not. But for me it's nice. It's fast. It's relaxing. You get a lot done. And when you undershade properly, orange becomes such a simple, beautiful, fun color to work with. And you'll notice throughout this video, I use lots of very thin layers with the airbrush. I'm never trying to coat everything all at once. I think this is one of those mistakes that people often make with an airbrush. They think they try to mix it thick and just blast it on because it's like, oh, well, you can, but you're not spray painting a house here. There's no reason not to work quite thin. Applying another layer with an airbrush takes seconds. So why not use that ability to build all sorts of fun variations in your color? Now, part of this for me was just an interesting challenge, something different. And I think that miniature painting often becomes about growth or learning or just finishing your army, right? You have to get it done for a tournament. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But I think it's also important that we, that we realize that there are limits to that. You know, we often push ourselves because it's an artistic pursuit. We compare ourselves to others because of the modern world and we see it all on social media. But it can just be about fun. And here I'm just playing around with colors. I made my nice orange squig with his white belly. I took some of this darker brown color and I just really slowly built in this wonderful smooth shadow transition with that burnt umber. Just being really laid back about it. 
And I want to just play around here, you know, mess with the colors. Again, this isn't a super serious model. It's not for competition. It's not for a current army I have. And that brings me to sort of my next point about fun, which is paint something that has no other purpose than you painting it. The reality is we oftentimes get very wrapped up where the hobby isn't actually the end. The painting isn't the end goal. And that's because maybe we have a competition. Maybe that we're trying to learn some new technique. Maybe we're just trying to get our army done in time for an upcoming tournament. That's all fine. There's nothing wrong with any of that. But sometimes it's good to just paint something for no other reason than you decided to paint it. It is the end in and of itself. And you can see how I'm just lining everything out and playing around and playing with all these really fun textures on this wig. Like he, the model here is so interesting and I'm just exploring it as I go. I didn't go into this with some great plan other than make it look like a tiger. And so when I see opportunities, I just kind of, hey, let me see how some color fits here, fits there. The journey of the model, of painting the model, becomes the end in and of itself. There's no other greater goal here. And in a way that's very freeing because I'm not worried about, oh, how is a judge gonna think about this? Or is this gonna work with the rest of my army or anything like that? Instead, I'm just thinking, cool, what's the next thing I wanna do here? How do I wanna paint these teeth? What fun things can I do with this tiger squig? In this case, because I chose to adapt art, I have some reference to work off of. And this can be a good way to have fun. Because if you're stressed a lot, maybe you're not as laid back as me with how you apply these things, that's fine. But then pick some art that you really love or imagine your favorite character from a book or take something from a movie and adapt it into a, a, a you know, a figure in this world. You know, painting like a Skeletor as a, as a thing or whatever you happen to like. It doesn't matter. This is the part we have to clench for, by the way, because now after I've done all this work on all this nuanced skin and picked out all these different highlights and picked out all the details, now I'm going to draw big black lines on everything. And I want to take a moment to talk about things like natural patterning. Notice how... I'm moving the brush very organically, single line. I don't pick it up very often, except when I'm done with the stripe. And notice how I alternate the pressure on the brush. So I get these natural waves, just little tiger waves. And that's because when I look at the reference art, here it is again, you can see that the tiger stripes aren't thick stripes. And this is one of the places I see people often go wrong with this kind of thing. They just do like one large line. But this is the kind of thing where when you're adapting from a real world thing, you've got to really spend time to see it. Not just look at it, but see it. There's those little circles where the, the stripe splits apart and creates a little oval. There's, it sweeps back from his eyes and has a completely different pattern on his head. Some of the stripes end and are shorter than others. Some are really long and travel almost the whole length of the body. Right? And they sweep back and forth in this swirl. So even though this is all a lot of freehand, it's also whatever I want it to be. I'm not trying to freehand some painting onto a banner. I just get to have fun. And if I make a line I don't like, I'll just integrate it, change it, make it thicker, swoop it around, add a different line next to it, make a little circle. And yes, it would be very hard to go back to my original orange, though it's not impossible, as you'll see in the next step. I think a lot of people fear color matching with their airbrush to a brush, but it's actually not that tough. You just pick the same paint and basically go, you can find a pretty close match. And if you then airbrush over your transition again, as we will later, nobody's going to notice the difference. 
After I put on all those black lines, he was a little dark. I didn't realize how much darker he would become because of the all the black lines. I should have thought about that. So now I'm just taking a lighter color and highlighting back up again, sort of in between the stripes to really create that maximum contrast. And I have to say, at this point, I was really having a lot of fun because he started to look like a tiger and I thought it was hilarious. Like I really enjoyed doing and painting or you doing this figure, painting this guy. I had looked at the art and found all these fun yellow tones and that's why you saw me glaze in the yellow. Uh, I had sort of looked at the transition around the nose and the mouth. And so I love that transition where the top of his maw is kind of white and goes into yellow and then orange around his nose. I felt like, yeah, okay, this is tigery. We got there. And so it became really fun to just go nuts and experiment and do this thing. And when you're trying something very different, the point of having fun, again, it isn't, I wouldn't try this on things that are for your army or for competition or stuff like that, because that's automatically gonna make you worry about other things. Instead, try it on something that doesn't matter that maybe it's there's maybe there's some army you love you've never wanted to collect it because you don't like its rules or something or some figure on a kickstarter you thought was really awesome that's sitting in your collection whatever pick that thing and just paint it for no other purpose than to paint it and experiment and have fun i'll point out that when i was doing this project and as i still am now as i'm recording this and probably as I still am when you're listening to this. I'm working on a very large army project that I'm taking very, very seriously. And to be honest, it's stressful. Each figure requires hours and hours of painting, very, very precise, detailed painting, often highly stressful. And sometimes it can be hard even for me to keep going in between each figure. This project completely recharged my batteries because it wasn't serious in the same way. I was able to mess around to experiment and it helped me unwind. And it helped me learn without it actually feeling like work. A quick note on what I'm doing here, because this thing has these open wounds with this like uh, these metal parts, these inorganic parts put in there, I wanted to make them look like open wounds. I noticed a lot of people don't actually do wound marks around there. So I took my nice dark purple and my pink tone and mixed it out into a good bruised skin. So it looks like there's actually ripped and torn skin there. That same pink I'm using for things like the gums as well, but I want it to feel like exposed, torn flesh. And that kind of thing is actually pretty easy. It's really just a matter of, bruised skin has a sort of purple, crimson, pink look to it. So it's a pretty easy paint job. And just little things like that were part of the fun here. Because as I looked over the fig, I'd get an idea and be like, hey, let's just try this. I've got these colors on my palette. Let's see how it feels, right? If I didn't like it, eh, no big deal. I could always glaze some orange or some yellow back over and subdue it, but why not give it a try? Why not see if I can make something look cool, look different, look fun? And so as I'm building up this tiger shark squig, uh, you know, one of the things that's really important is I wanted to do a lot of work on the teeth. Teeth are a big part of every squig. They are basically just beach balls with big maws. As are these little tiny, I don't know, growths on him, I guess. I'm not sure what they are. So I'm just going through and picking all these things out now so that that way I can kind of decide where I want to go with them which is the other part about fun. Even though I knew at the beginning of this, I wanted a tiger, which is a plan. I didn't have every part of the model planned out and neither do you need to, you don't need to either. When you sit down to paint something, don't feel like you got to do 20 test models. Like you need to understand every volume, every shape that you need to know the color for every paint you'll have to have. If you try that sort of thing, you'll just never actually paint anything. Instead, I knew the general plan, like, oh, we're gonna, you know, 
make him look like a tiger, because tigers are cool. And then from there, I would just kind of experiment, see what happens. And I spent a lot of time on the teeth because I thought, you know, this is a, it's his face. It's the big squig's face and it's where you're going to look a lot. So you saw me do things like work in the yellow brown there to make it look like the teeth are all blacky. And then slowly covering less and less of the tooth with darker and darker colors. Because I don't imagine this big giant squig uh, brushes his teeth very often. Probably not great dental care on whatever the uh, work wa that he's a part of has. Uh, and then finally doing those bone striations just to get the teeth looking really nice and sharp and making sure that the tips where he's normally biting into things are nice and bright white. So a lot of teeth work. And again, that's the next thing. I actually had never really tried that yellow brown sort of recipe on teeth before. That sort of placky, gross look. But after doing it, I was like, yeah, I, I really like this. I think that's cool. And it gave me something else in my toolbox for the future. Final pieces, uh, or some of the final pieces are his eyes. Uh, they don't, he doesn't have huge eyes, but you notice there, like I put on a bunch of red paint and then let it sit there and then wicked off the excess. Cause I just wanted it to kind of stain the area around the eye to make that red pink sink in a little more and make it feel like an, a, an eye. We tend to, humans that is, tend to react to uh, red soft pinks around eyes. We That sort of looks natural to us. Even if the eye is a weird bright red and sitting on a giant tiger monster. So now it's just clean up stuff. I'm working through the final items, making sure that I like where everything lasts making sure that the eyes and the face of the squig are nice and compelling because again, he's a big part of this model. It's not that the orc's not cool, he is cool, but let's face it, the giant squig is really the main show here. The orc is just the opening act. And so I wanted to make him really feel alive and he's where I spent most of my time. The final thing I do there with the, the skin is just kind of glaze over everything with a light orange. This is an attempt to kind of bring back the feeling of the fur. A lot of fur, the orange gets up over the black. And you couldn't really do that. So I had to just put a nice light, light glaze over to lighten up the upper parts. Now we're going to do some spittle. This is our old friend Uhu glue. You just get a sharp stick, drag it from one area, touch it to the bottom teeth. You can, you don't have to worry about it getting other places. You can pull it off later. Touch it to the top teeth and then drag it down to the bottom teeth again. And you can create little nice spit globules like you see there. Uh, so those are super fun. It's really fun to mess with Uhu glue. You can order it uh, online in various places. And it's just it's just really fun to like make this fun spit thing. Uh, it dries super fast. In fact, this dried for me as I was, because I had to sort of put it down and then get the camera going. It actually dried a little more than I wanted. But if the toothpick doesn't work, you can always grab tweezers or something and put it on there. So there he is all finished. This was a really fun project for me. I hope you liked watching it. I hope this inspires you to go out and try a fun project of your own. Do something wacky, get crazy, grab a fig from an army you've never painted. Paint that bust you've had sitting in your extra collection for a long time. Just remember the hobby isn't just for painting armies or winning competitions or even learning your next steps. It can also just be about having fun and push and paint. If you liked that, give it a like, subscribe for more hobby cheating in the future. If you've got any questions, drop that down below. Tell me what you paint for fun to unwind, to de-stress, and to just have a great time. But I thank you for watching this one, and we'll see you next time.